Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, hospitals feel the pressure of Omicron. People at the bedside are suffering. Nurses are breaking down. Why it's likely to get worse before it gets better. Omicron and children. We could see more children hospitalized over a very short period of time. The risks kids face from this variant. The truth about that evening glass of wine. Do you think of alcohol as a carcinogen? Is there any safe amount of alcohol? Even drinking one drink a day increases your risk. And a winter highway mess traps hundreds of drivers in Virginia for hours. My heart go out to the young lady. Got her two-year-old baby. She has no food. How they worked together to make it through. This is The National. After provinces began to lose track of infections and rushed to reimpose restrictions. Tonight, some hospitals are already reaching a breaking point and there's little relief in sight. The unprecedented surge in average daily new cases in Canada started mid-December. They broke the previous national record two weeks ago. Then we started hitting a ceiling on testing capacity. Current numbers considered a vast undercount. The surge in COVID hospitalization started about a week later. They've more than doubled since. And if they keep following case trends, hospitalizations are on track to get far worse. It's worth mentioning, some patients were in the hospital for reasons other than COVID and tested positive on arrival. And even controlling those infections still means an added burden for staff. As Thomas Dagla shows us, COVID strain is already pushing hospitals into a disaster response mode. For the second time since the start of the pandemic, troops are again on the ground in Quebec, helping now with the vaccination effort. Hospitals don't have the staff to spare. We have to, uh, to act very rapidly. We want to preserve our, our capacity. With thousands of healthcare staff isolating or otherwise away from work, Quebec is the latest province to limit who can get a PCR test and reduce the isolation time for suspected cases to as little as five days. You can't run a large hospital when so many people can't show up, you know, so you can see where the expediency comes in, but it certainly is not a zero risk endeavor. New Brunswick says 571 healthcare workers are isolating at home as officials coast to coast expect more staff shortages. We're gonna face considerable staff challenges with this much COVID-19 in the community. Two Toronto area hospitals have activated a so-called code orange, urgently cutting services so staff can be reassigned to deal with COVID. Nurses were being stretched too thin. We like it to be one to four, one nurse for every four patients or one nurse to every five patients. And we were getting close to one to 10 and we felt that that was not safe. In Ontario, case counts are reaching levels that were unimaginable just days ago. With testing restricted, experts can only estimate. What probably happens is that we only diagnose one in five cases, meaning these 20,000 are more like 100,000 already. And although only a small percentage will need critical care, already the impact in hospital brings this nurse to tears. Because we have people with surgeries that are cancelled, heart surgeries are cancelled, cancer surgeries are cancelled. People at the bedside are suffering. Nurses are breaking down. Okay, so Thomas, how long are officials expecting this strain on hospitals to continue? Well, there's going to be a peak and then case counts are going to start to go down, uh, Andrew. You heard the head of uh, William Osler Health System in the piece there. He said at his hospitals, uh, the peak might just be a few days away. But the mayor of Toronto, John Tory, said today in this city, certainly his experts are telling him the peak may still be four to six weeks away. So uh, whatever happens, some hospitals could still be feeling pressure well into February, Andrew. Thomas Daigle, thank you very much. You're welcome. Now that nurse you saw at the end of Thomas's piece, she told CBC News her reaction when she heard about the two Toronto area hospitals declaring a code orange. For her, it means sick people who need help and who won't get it in time. My heart broke. My heart broke really hard because I know what that means. That is a disaster. Um, a code orange is called because of a nursing shortage. I want people to know it's because of a nursing shortage. I knew January was going to be hard and um, I knew schools were going to close. So my question is, as an ICU nurse going to the bedside, I don't have all the data that epidem epidemiologists do have. I see patients at the bedside. If I knew that it was going to be so bad, 
in January? How come the government didn't know? I say this because I see patients who have had surgeries being canceled. I see, uh, and unfortunately, um, we know that racialized people are so impacted in this pandemic. Why do we have a code orange called in Brampton Civic? Why? Why? And William Osler, these are neighborhoods that are so congregated. These are people, areas where we have racialized communities. In Alberta, officials have confirmed the death of a child from COVID-19. We can report the child was in the age range of five to nine years old and had a complex medical condition. The surge in COVID cases is putting renewed concern on the risks kids face with hospitals in the U.S. reporting a spike in young COVID patients. But as Christine Birak shows us, that isn't the case for hospitals here in Canada just yet. Inside the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, doctors are seeing a small wave of new patients. Since the holidays, we've had numerous infants who've been admitted with COVID and all of whom had mothers who were completely unvaccinated. Pediatric cases are still rare in Canada, but just days into this new year, the U.S. CDC says roughly 600 children with COVID-19 are being admitted to hospitals daily, including four-month-old Grayson Perry, who's clearly struggling to breathe. His mother worries he may need to be intubated. It's just really scary. So I just hope that, you know, he's able to get better. She thinks he caught the virus at a family Christmas gathering. Grayson's one of nearly 70 children now hospitalized at Texas Children's. Doctors say it's a record high for America's largest pediatric hospital. The problem is that with so many children and adults infected, even if the percent hospitalization rate is lower, we're still, uh, we could see more children hospitalized. Canada's largest children's hospital had fewer than five patients with COVID-19 a month ago. Now, that number is 12. SickKids Hospital says in general, patients are experiencing mild illness with symptoms such as fever and dehydration. Doctors are encouraging everyone who's eligible to get vaccinated, especially those who are pregnant. We know that vaccination during pregnancy uh, allows for a passive transfer of antibodies produced by mom across the placenta uh, to the baby, and that these antibodies we expect do help protect baby uh, during those first few weeks of life when they might be most vulnerable. He adds repeated studies have shown COVID vaccines are safe during pregnancy. As for vaccines for children under five, they're still in the works. But Moderna says it's hoping to have results from its pediatric trial by the end of the month. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now in just a few minutes, the doctors will be here with advice for parents, including how to separate cold symptoms from COVID and whether we need to rethink how we approach masks and shots. Now both PEI and Manitoba pushed back their return to class dates today as they each reported record high COVID cases. After this week's winter break extension, Manitoba students will move to remote learning until the 17th. PEI will also keep kids in online learning until at least then. And when they do go back, masks will be required. Now, many kids are still scheduled to come back sooner, raising the question of how to keep the classroom as safe as possible. Better ventilation and filtration is an option, but as Julia Wong shows us, not a simple one. The sound of a high-efficiency particulate air, or HEPA filter, is what Jill Davy Shaw would like her 11-year-old daughter to hear at school. Children are removing masks to eat lunch, um, where they're spending a, a long time throughout the day, that that was something that just made sense. Davies Shaw and other parents fundraised in the fall to buy a HEPA filter for the classroom, but were told ventilation was adequate. That school board tells CBC News it's looking into them now as Omicron pushes case counts in Canada to record levels. I think that the time for this is yesterday and it really needs to happen urgently at this point. HEPA filters can reduce the concentration of some viruses in the air. Parents in many parts of Canada are calling for them before kids return to the classroom. The Public Health Agency of Canada says their effectiveness in reducing the transmission of the novel coronavirus has not been demonstrated yet, but they can be used as an additional tool. You are definitely improving or in fact reducing the risk for their children. It's a patchwork rollout across the country. 
Ontario has sent thousands to certain schools. BC is promising them and New Brunswick is looking into it. This pandemic is definitely a really good reason to accelerate all this. Better air quality is better for learning, it's better for everybody's health. And so it seemed to me to be a no brainer. Parents and staff at a school just outside of Edmonton are not waiting. They built their own air purifiers. That extra layer for our families to know that, that the school is willing to look a little bit above and beyond and creatively to ensure that we've got the best space possible for our kids. With a tool that many believe is better than nothing. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. A historic $40 billion agreement has been reached between the federal government and Indigenous leaders to compensate First Nations people harmed by the child welfare system and to reform it for the children of the future. Olivia Stefanovic has the details and what happens next. Ashley Box searched her whole life for recognition of the harm suffered after she was taken from her mother at birth. My biological family tried to adopt me um, and bring me home and they were denied because of uh, the lack of resources on reserves. No amount of money can change the past, but she's hopeful it can make some difference for the future. Compensation will enable people to, uh, to, to address their own needs and do what they need to reconnect and do what they need to um, not just survive, but like thrive. The federal government is offering $40 billion, the largest ever proposed class action settlement in Canada. Historic injustices require historic reparations. $20 billion to compensate First Nations children on reserve and in the Yukon, removed from their homes over the past 31 years. Parents and caregivers would also be compensated as would any child denied services, such as accessing medical equipment under Jordan's principle. I acknowledge your pain and your loss, the loss of time and, a fam and family life with your siblings. I'm sorry you didn't, didn't have that. No, we're gonna do it together. The remaining $20 billion is for long-term reform, including an independent review of Indigenous Services Canada and support for youth aging out of care. Youth in care have been courageously advocating for decades to say, you know what, when we turn 18, don't just turn us out onto the streets. The tentative deal could end a 15-year legal battle. Once finalized, the government says it will drop an appeal of a federal court ruling upholding a landmark Canadian Human Rights Tribunal order. It called on the government to pay $40,000 to each affected First Nations child and caregiver. This sets the foundation um, nicely to end the discrimination and racism. Okay, so Olivia, under this deal, how much is each affected First Nations child and family expected to get? Well, Andrew, the federal government says everyone covered by this agreement is expected to get at least $40,000 and potentially more based on a formula they still have to develop for compensation. The parties have agreed to negotiate these final details until the end of March. Then the agreement has to go before the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and federal court for final approval. The parties are hopeful this will all be sorted out by the end of this year so compensation can start flowing to an estimated 200,000 people. Okay, Olivia, thank you. You're welcome. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau received his COVID-19 booster shot today. The Prime Minister rolled up his sleeve for a third shot this morning at an Ottawa pharmacy. His first two doses of the vaccine were in April and July of last year. One million. Pretty staggering number. In just a single day yesterday, the United States recorded more than a million new COVID cases. Now, part of the reason why this number is so large is because there were some delays in reporting over the holiday weekend. But still, the seven-day average of new COVID cases in the States has reached a global record. And as Katie Simpson reports, it's likely going to get worse before it gets better. Prepared for the chilly weather and a wait. Dozens of people line up around this DC library. If you've got two hours to spare, you can score two boxes of free at-home rapid COVID tests. Not everybody can afford to take off work to come stand here for two hours. Not everybody has that flexibility. Lineups are a problem all over the country. As the US smashes records, reporting more than one million COVID cases on Monday alone. 
In reality, the number is likely much higher. Not all cases detected by at-home tests get recorded. Omicron is very transmissible, transmissible variant, but much different than anything we've seen before. We shipped out the Before first a White House COVID briefing, the president vaccine, warned there will be more suffering ahead, urging Americans again to get vaccinated. He announced the military is being deployed to help staff overwhelmed hospitals. Unvaccinated are taking up hospital beds and crowding emergency rooms and intensive care units. That's just place other people who need access to those hospitals. The situation is so dire in Maryland, the governor declared a 30-day state of emergency, calling up 1,000 members of the National Guard to help local health officials. The next four to six weeks will be the most challenging time of the entire pandemic. At the D.C. library, people here are trying to prepare for the challenges ahead. We want to make sure that we're safe and we test before we go out and engage others. Feeney Freeman and her family are doing what they can to protect themselves. They are so over the pandemic. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, I don't want to ever do it again. I think it was one of the worst experiences ever. Worst experiences ever. This experience is nowhere near over. Cases and hospitalizations in the U.S. will continue to rise. Along with that, expect more disruptions to everyday life. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Chinese authorities continue to rely on a zero COVID policy to curb Omicron. They've locked down a second major city, this one with over a million residents. As Aaron Collins tells us, with the Winter Olympics one month away, many are questioning if the measures will be enough to keep athletes safe. A city of 13 million locked down since December 23rd. Residents of Xi'an unable to leave home even for essentials. The government now delivers groceries door to door. Now the city of Yuzhou, about 800 kilometers from Beijing, is locked down too after just three cases of COVID turned up there. Only those working to contain the virus are allowed out in the two cities. This ambulance driver says they're on call 24-7 to transfer COVID patients to hospital. Well, so far, the calls aren't coming. Xi'an reported fewer than 100 symptomatic COVID cases yesterday. Still, the lockdowns continue as China pursues its COVID zero policy. These measures are quite strict, uh, but there is, uh, generally speaking, broad support from its uh, population. All this with the Winter Olympics just a month away and officials hopeful that these games can still be a success. Our ambition is always that big events like the Olympics also leave a legacy and continue to have an impact on society when the athletes are long gone. Um, Beijing has set the standard very high. Of course, some athletes have already decided to skip the games. NHL players opted out as the Omicron variant took hold in North America. And some wonder if even China's COVID zero policy will be enough. I feel as though the Omicron variant is the uh, the greatest challenge that they'll face in being able to maintain COVID zero in the few weeks leading up to the Olympics. But in China, the lockdowns go on. And despite some reports of harsh conditions, no sign they'll be relaxed anytime soon. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. OK, next, the doctors are here with more on Omicron and kids. Any cold must be thought of as potential COVID. Those are reasons to take them in to get seen. From the most common symptoms to the best protection, the latest advice for parents. Trapped on one of the busiest highways in the U.S. For 18 hours, we sat there not knowing what was going on. The stories of kindness from a snowy I-95. Plus the facts about alcohol and cancer. People putting really dangerous stuff in their bodies and they don't know, and it's not worth it. And the Canadians who want a warning on every bottle. Why is this so important to you? I don't like when people are lied to. We're back in two. Welcome back. With Omicron cases surging across the country, we wanted to spend some time talking about kids. Um, lots of them are vaccinated, but even more aren't. So 
We're going to talk about what Omicron means for children uh, with pediatric infectious diseases specialist Dr. Jacqueline Wong and Dr. Fatima Kakar. Uh, hello to the both of you. Dr. Wong, uh, I'll start with you. You know, so many kids across the country have seen their school starts delayed, right? Uh, how much have schools been driving transmission or is it just reflecting what's in the general population? Yeah, what we've seen throughout the different waves is, you know, schools uh, reflect what's going on in the community. So the data here in Ontario, the data in other parts of Canada and other countries um, consistently show that it's reflecting what's going on in the community, but not the main driver of transmission. And yet, you know, Dr. Kakar, last I checked, the, the, the vaccination rate for kids under 12 was quite low. Uh, what's the most common concern that you hear? And, and what do you tell those parents? I think it's twofold. I think in part, people were under the impression that kids aren't going to be very sick. So, you know, they don't need the vaccine. And then on the other hand, they were worried about not enough data. And so what I'd like to tell them is, you know, we've got over 8 million U.S. kids who've had the vaccine without any side effects. And really, kids are getting sick and getting hospitalized from COVID. So I do urge parents to get the vaccine. Since you brought up symptoms, Dr. Kakar, let's talk about those. What are the symptoms that parents should be watching for uh, in their children? So this is important because Omicron is different from the previous COVID waves that we've had. Before it was fever, maybe GI symptoms, but now it's very respiratory. So things such as congestion, cough, sore throat can be signs even without a fever. So essentially Omicron is looking like a cold in kids. And so any cold must be thought of as potential COVID. And Dr. Wong, what is the point at which, you know, one's child has developed symptoms where you think, okay, this is actually potentially something much more serious than what it is right now. I've got to go see a doctor or go to the hospital. Right. So like the advice that we would give in terms of help, keep helping parents guide, you know, when to seek um, uh, further assessment for is similar to other respiratory viruses or the flu. So, you know, there are a lot of things that can be done at home to help your kids stay comfortable, to help um, bring down the fever if they have one. Um, but if those um, interventions stop working, so if their fever stops responding to either the acetaminophen or the ibuprofen, or it becomes very difficult to maintain kind of the hydration of your child, like they're getting dehydrated or they're so sleepy or they're throwing up so much they can't keep anything down. Um, those are reasons to take them in to get seen. And of course, as Dr. Kakar mentioned, this um, current wave with the Omicron variant has a lot more focus on respiratory symptoms. So if your child is having difficulty breathing, so breathing very fast, or if you're watching them breathe without their shirt on and you're seeing their muscles are working really hard to take those breaths in, um, or if you're noticing that they're pale um, or blue around the lips, those are always reasons to have them seen by a doctor, regardless if it's Omicron or COVID or another respiratory infection. And, and Dr. Wong, in terms of avoiding getting sick altogether, you know, one conversation that we've had in our own family, I, I have two little girls, is about masking and, and whether we need to think about upgrading the kids' masks. Where, where does the science stand on that now? Yeah, so the, the science is limited in terms of studying masks in kids. And, and granted, part of it is the variability in terms of the range, age range in kids and their ability to keep different masks on. Um, so I would still say that if parents um, would like to use masks as one of the tools, one of the layers for protecting their kids um, from getting the uh, COVID infection or other respiratory infections, you know, we still stick to um, a mask with multiple layers, making sure that the fit is good, making sure that it's comfortable for kids because at the end of the day, if it's uncomfortable, they're not going to be able to wear it. So, you know, to your question about whether we should be talking about an upgrade, I'm assuming people are referring to N95 masks, you know, those aren't designed for small little faces. Um, the comfort, the fit, it's not designed for those small kids. So it, it no longer has that benefit that people are hoping for. Um, if kids can't keep it on, if the fit is just the wrong size for them. So uh, I would stick with a cloth mask that fits well. Okay. And Dr. Kakar, I have time for one more question. Um, you know, for kids who have gotten one dose and then who are considering getting the second dose before the recommended eight-week interval, you know, we've had doctors on our program talk about fast-tracking the second dose, getting it as soon as three, four, you know, five weeks after the first. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I've had this question a lot this week. I think the reason we chose that eight week interval was uh, to minimize side effects and to increase the durability of the antibody response. Now, I'm not worried about safety if we're gonna shorten the dosing interval. We've got a lot of good safety data. What we lose out a little bit is the duration of the response. What I'm suggesting is I think if you're in a part of the country where you can uh, get that dose sooner, and if you have very vulnerable people in your household, multi-generational households, grandparents, then you could potentially get it at the four to six week mark, but I wouldn't go below four weeks because that's really our standard for second doses for vaccines. All right, we packed a lot of information in there uh, and a lot of good answers. Uh, Dr. Wong, Dr. Kakar, thank you so much. Thank you. And when we come back, warnings have been on cigarettes for decades. Is it time to do the same for alcohol? Pretty much most people don't know that alcohol causes cancer. What do you think about that? It's shocking. We'll look at why most people don't think of alcohol as a carcinogen right after the break. Welcome back. Just a few days into the new year, and some of those resolutions are probably getting put to the test. A common one is to drink less alcohol, and it's one you might want to stick to. As Joanna Romiliota shows us, even moderate drinking comes with a risk of cancer. It's not a secret, but it may as well be. Alcohol, any amount of alcohol can cause cancer. Oh, I did not know that. This is like the first time I'm hearing about it. I didn't know that. Cancer's scary. The truth is scary. Alcohol is a level one carcinogen, right up there with tobacco and asbestos. It's one of the top three causes of preventable cancer. So why aren't Canadians being warned about it? There's a lot of misinformation out there. Bottom line is we're in the dark and the industry likes it that way. Tim Stockwell is a scientist with the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research at the University of Victoria. He wants people to know the truth. We probably think alcohol's good for you in moderation. And the industry's been very strong at promoting that message. Is there any safe amount of alcohol? Well, nothing's completely safe. Even drinking one drink a day increases your risk of some cancers, including if you're a woman, breast cancer, but also cancers of the digestive system. And the risk increases with every drink you take. Kathy Andrews had no idea that the wine she enjoyed most nights before she got pregnant was dangerous. The Vancouver resident ran into the truth after she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2016. Some of the risk factors for me was that I'd been through IVF with my child and then pregnancy, uh, as well as a stressful lifestyle and drinking, not exercising enough. So all of those things, I think, played a role. When you look back now, how much did you know about the risk alcohol carries? Well, very little. Uh, I think there's a lot of mixed messages in the media about alcohol and how it actually can be quite good for you, especially for your heart. What I discovered was that there's quite a lot of research around the connection between alcohol and breast cancer. And what did you think when you read that? Why don't I know this? Most Canadians don't know that their cocktail should come with a cancer warning. And drinking is so normalized, so celebrated, the truth is hard to swallow. Alcohol was linked to 7,000 new cancer cases in Canada in 2020 alone. And those studies that suggest drinking can be good for you, they've been debunked. Dr. Fawad Iqbal is a radiation oncologist at the Durham Regional Cancer Centre in Oshawa, Ontario. I treat common cancers, treat lung cancer, breast cancer and colorectal cancers. And I've never, ever had a lung cancer patient ask me, did smoking cause my cancer? Whereas breast cancer and colorectal cancer Pretty much most people don't know that alcohol causes cancer. What do you think about that? It's shocking, I guess I would say. Like we have warning labels on everything I can think of. I bought my kids fishing rods this summer. Their fishing rods had warning labels that says, this fishing rod can cause cancer. Whereas, you know, a level one carcinogen that is everywhere has no particular warnings on it. The CMA should advocate for explicit labeling of alcoholic beverages, warning of carcinogenic risk to the consumer. Iqbal has drafted a proposal to the Canadian Medical Association and has reached out to Ontario's Liquor Board, provincial and federal health authorities, as well as to the Prime Minister. Why is this so important to you? I don't like when people are lied to, including myself. 
this toxin is there for everybody to consume and nobody's warning you. Why do you think it's not out there? Money. It, it boils down to money. What do you mean? Alcohol is a $1.5 trillion a year industry. They'll lose money. That's a heavy lobby group. And money wins at the end of the day. Money won in the Yukon in 2017. This is where the first study of alcohol cancer labels was tried but barely got tested. Less than a month after researchers put warning labels on alcohol spelling out the cancer risk, they came off under pressure from the alcohol industry. There's uh, examples of emails from the liquor industry. Designing. Stockwell was one of the study um, leaders. The information about cancer was alarmist and misleading. He has the emails from industry representatives to the Yukon government, claiming the cancer labels were defamatory. The territory, he says, couldn't afford a costly legal battle, so the cancer warning labels were pulled. Why was the cancer word so problematic, you think? Well, I think because it's not a good image for their product. You don't need to be a marketing expert to say it's a no-no to say if you drink this, it might give you cancer. The alcohol industry continues to evade questions about the cancer risk. We asked Beer Canada, Spirits Canada and Wine Growers Canada whether they accept the link between alcohol and cancer and whether they believe they have a responsibility to inform consumers of that risk. All three focus their answers on the need to drink responsibly and in moderation. Spirits Canada also refer to the discredited research of the health benefits of drinking alcohol. Alcohol causes cancer. The truth may be inconvenient to industry, but awareness is slowly spreading. In Australia, a graphic public health campaign lays out the cancer risk. This one from the U.S. is a stark warning to women about the risk of breast cancer. And just before the pandemic, British Columbia's Fraser Health Authority ran posters spelling out the cancer risks to everyone. And the Yukon study the industry tried to suppress? It's being cited by researchers around the world because it proves information does have an impact. Even though the cancer labels were taken off early, people remembered them and the other labels that stayed on. By the end of the study, alcohol sales dropped by 7%. Another key finding? People were furious that this existential threat that is masquerading as something safe and glamorous and normal, and it's slowly killing people. Anyone who understands those facts would feel there's a moral obligation on the government to tell its citizens about these risks. Several European countries are considering cancer warning labels on alcohol. We asked Health Canada if it plans to do the same. It says it continues to fund research into the best ways to inform Canadians of the various harms associated with alcohol use and says updates to the current national low-risk drinking guidelines and standard drink information are coming. They make an informed choice. Andrew says there is no time to waste. People do need to know. And I think it's a deterrent if you know. Would it have changed anything for you? Definitely, yes. I w would have abstained or drank a whole lot less, or a lot sooner. Right. Now you got it. Oh, she's grateful yeah. that she's recovering, but she wants people to know more than she did. You can cut their lives short and take them away from the people that love them. People putting really dangerous stuff in their bodies and they don't know and it's not worth it yeah yeah it's not worth it knowing the risks she says means knowing how much you're willing to risk too exactly. Joanna Rumeliotis CBC News Vancouver well, next, a major U.S. highway ground to a halt with hundreds stranded in the cold. 7-Eleven's closed. There's no fuel. You know, my heart go out to the young lady. Got her two-year-old baby. She has no food. The moments of kindness that helped them through a winter emergency right after the break. Welcome back. In the U.S. tonight, crews have finally managed to rescue hundreds of drivers trapped on a major highway in freezing weather. Some were stuck there since Monday morning. Chris Reyes shows us what they had to deal with. 
a standstill stretching almost 80 kilometers on the Interstate 95 in Virginia. It's treacherous. It's, it's treacherous out here, to say the least. 30 centimeters of snow and multiple crashes shut down one of the busiest highways in the U.S. Monday night. We don't have winter jackets with us. We have light jackets because we were in Florida. By Tuesday afternoon, drivers were still stuck, spending the night in their cars, including young children, many running low on food, fuel, and heat. 7-Eleven's closed. There's no fuel. You know, my heart go out to the young lady. Got her two-year-old baby. She has no food. When I say ground to a halt, I mean all three lanes of traffic just stopped. For 18 hours, we sat there not knowing what was going on. U.S. Senator Tim Kaine was stranded for more than 27 hours and talked to reporters while he was stuck on the road. I had a, one orange, and that's the only food I've had since Sunday night. The senator was traveling from Virginia to Washington, D.C. He left Monday at 1 p.m. and didn't get to his office until late Tuesday afternoon. You know, it was kind of a survival challenge. I mean, you're, you're, you're trying not to run out of gas. Despite the dangerously cold conditions, those on the road said there was no shortage of warmth and hospitality. Truck drivers were actually reaching out to other drivers as well and saying, hey, if you're hungry, if you're cold, if you're thirsty, reach out to a truck driver. We always have uh, snacks. We always have extra blankets. We always have extra drinks. And uh, honestly, the truck drivers were the real, uh, the real heroes there. And they started distributing loaves of bread to people. So it was the kindness of strangers that kept us through it, not the efficiency of any state official. Regulars of the route call the traffic nightmare something they've never seen before. A mix of heavy snow, crashes, abandoned vehicles, and stalled emergency response. State officials admit they were overwhelmed and are now looking at how to prevent the same problem in the future. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Well, former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo will not face charges over allegations that he forcibly touched a female aide. Prosecutors say Cuomo's accuser is cooperative and credible, but they don't believe there's enough evidence to bring the case to court. The ex-governor resigned in August over sexual harassment allegations that he has repeatedly denied. A lawsuit over Nirvana's infamous Nevermind album cover has been dismissed. Spencer Eldon, who was pictured naked as a baby, had alleged the band sexually exploited him and accused the rock group of engaging in child pornography. The dismissal came after Eldon's lawyers missed a deadline to respond to Nirvana's motion to dismiss. However, he has until January 13th to refile an amended version. A U.S. federal judge is deciding whether a civil case against Prince Andrew can proceed. Virginia Jufri claims the Duke of York sexually assaulted her when she was a teen 20 years ago. As Farah Morale explains, lawyers for Prince Andrew are hinging their hopes of getting the case dropped on two words. At the heart of this case, the night this photo was captured, 17-year-old Virginia Jufre pictured with Prince Andrew. In a civil suit, Jufre claims she was flown to London by Jeffrey Epstein and now convicted sex trafficker Ghislaine Maxwell and forced to have sex with the prince. Claims he has denied through his lawyers and publicly in a rare 2019 interview with the BBC. I don't remember meeting her at all. Today, lawyers for the prince argued the case should be tossed because of a settlement Jufre already reached with Epstein in 2009. The details of that were recently made public. Epstein agreed to pay her $500,000 to drop the case, and Jufre agreed to release and forever discharge any other person who could have been included as a potential defendant from all actions. It really will come down to how the judge interprets those two words, potential defendant. While the prince's lawyers argued and, that means uh, he's excluded he, from he liability, this legal strange. expert says the judge didn't seem convinced. But you could tell um, that Judge Kaplan was skeptical about whether that stands up in law just because of, you know, the consequences of a clause like that. The judge said he'll release his decision very soon. It's one the royal family will be watching closely. Well, certainly there's no good outcome uh, for him here. Royal commentators say That's even if the case is dismissed, it'll likely be on a technicality, leading to further today. blowback. And he'll be perceived to have been uh, dodging the bullet uh, thanks to a, a rather sleazy agreement signed by a convicted, uh, convicted um, paedophile. Platinum Jubilee celebrations are set to begin for the Queen this year. The looming legal decision involving her son now threatens to cast a dark shadow over the festive mood. Farah Morali, CBC News, London. 
when we come back, turning a painful moment into progress. Well, this beautiful little girl, uh, you know, helped change the world. We'll tell you how right after the break. I'm Jeannie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. One year after an angry mob stormed the U.S. Capitol, amid a long drawn out investigation into what happened and a deepening political divide, we're asking, what does the future of American democracy look like? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This was a special day for an 11-year-old girl from Cody First Nation in Saskatchewan. It's been just over a year since she was shamed for wearing a traditional ribbon skirt to her school's formal day. But a lot's changed since then. As Bonnie Allen shows us, today the school marked its first annual ribbon skirt day. When 11-year-old Isabella Kulak from Cody First Nation put on her traditional ribbon skirt this morning, when she sewed herself, she felt like a superhero, ready for her school's first annual ribbon skirt day. The ribbon skirt represents to me strength, resilience and womanhood. Last winter, Kulak was excited to wear her ribbon skirt to formal day at her CAMSAC school. But then an educational assistant made her feel ashamed, saying her outfit didn't match and that she should dress like other girls. That I could wear something else, like a store-bought dress. Her great aunt Judy Pelly shared the story on Facebook and women around the world donned ribbon skirts in solidarity. I'm extremely, extremely proud of her because she came, she's, she's been a catalyst for change across the world. Uh, her bravery and her resilience has caused uh, a movement across the, the globe. I've apologized personally to Bella's parents and to Bella herself. The director of education was quick to apologize last year, calling it an example of systemic racism and declaring January 4th Ribbon Skirt Day, a day for students to celebrate their culture and uniqueness. We're going to have a smudge and pray and it's going to be a good day. Kulak's mother has also been hired by the school division as an Indigenous community worker. Actually, I'm working at the school now and we've started a ribbon skirt class and we're getting into beading and a drum group and the sky's the limit and everything's going great. Other girls and women across Canada also wore their traditional skirts today and a Manitoba senator has sponsored a bill to make January 4th a national ribbon skirt day. It's pretty cool. The bill has already received second reading in the Senate. Well, this beautiful little girl, uh, you know, helped change the world. On this day, Kulak says she feels respected and understood. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. Okay, up next, why a group of strangers decided to buy a house together. Lauren on the couch is Donna's husband. They moved here from Edmonton. They joined us without having seen us except on Zoom. A story of community and that magnificent house coming up in our moment. Well, this is the dream home of couple Francis and Jim. The house is over 5,400 square feet, but it's not just for them. With the help of five strangers, they were able to buy this house and turn it into a co-living cooperative home. From food to chores, the residents share it all. And this community living is our moment tonight. Welcome to Prairie Rivers Co-Living Cooperative. Why do we want to share a home? Just so we can create a happy, healthy environment for growing older. This is the living room right from the front with its bay windows to the fireplace at the other end. It's just lonely being by yourself all the time. And it just seems like so much uh, much richer way to live is in community, sharing experiences and support. This is James, one of our community members. <laughs> During the pandemic, it became evident how, uh, how frustrating it is to live, uh, live alone. I found myself uh, bouncing around quite a bit. We've watched too many people growing old alone in their own homes. Again, no doors. <laughs> There's so much emphasis in our culture on people being independent. Uh, we think a better word is interdependent because people need each other for support. So first things, a beautiful home, but, but also, you know, besides all of the, I guess, the obvious perks, right, of 
of sharing the, the, you know, the costs, the chores, the company. Uh, there have been some smaller perks as well, uh, some interesting ones, like uh, experiencing ethnic cooking for the first time. Apparently that's new for Francis. There's a musician in the group, so they get music uh, every so often. Beautiful thing. That's The National for this January 4th. Have a great night.